Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic television program. Today, we're going to interview Larry Fry. His new book on teaching communication activism. Welcome to Rip Rap. Oh, thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you back. <laughs> That's right. Um, and as I was reading this book, this is a, a ton of information. Mm -hmm. And what I enjoyed is how complex and intricate it is and the care that you took on what the 50 cent word is meta discourse on the structure of it. Oh, thank you. We worked really hard, my uh, co-editor David Palmer and I, in terms of how to just put something like this together, kind of um, inventing the wheel, I would say. I read a lot of books where people didn't do that. and that, Well, it's hard to follow their point. I'm a heavy-handed editor to begin with, so I think these chapters went through probably, I'd say, four to five edits each, so I really do want a kind of uniformity to run through the chapters, um, but also to give the freedom to the authors to write what they're going to write. Well, one of the questions that came up immediately what is, is what is communication activism pedagogy? Yeah, that's the heart of the matter. Um, it's a type of pedagogy, it's a unique form that essentially says look, maybe we could teach students how to intervene into discourses that are unjust to try to make them more just. And so these are communication educators who use their knowledge, their communication theories, their methods, their pedagogies, their other practices to try to help students to understand how could we actually intervene to do something about the significant social justice problems of our time? One of the things that I thought was fascinating is that there's somewhat of a distinction between this and critical pedagogy. Right, so I would say that there's two things we're attacking. Um, one is, of course, the corporate education model. That, and critical pedagogy has been great on that too, that if you really look at education today, most of the kinds of courses um, are really hammering home a kind of corporate education where they're privileging the business sector. And we talk about um, students as clients now at the university. So critical pedagogy was uh, in large measure a response to that. Of course, we could also talk about civic education in between that tried to go back to look at the kind of civic problems that people had. Critical pedagogy is essentially about making people aware of injustice. And it's a wonderful pedagogy. It's incredibly important. It's a huge ally of ours. But we think that we're pushing it a little farther by saying, look, awareness is not sufficient. You know, some people might call that inflicted insight. You know, that you, we know all of the social problems that are out there. We make students aware of them, yet we do nothing about it. And so a cap is really trying to do communication, activism, pedagogy, is essentially take that next step and teach students how to actually intervene with affected community members, with social justice organizations, to do something about these particular problems. And I really enjoyed the theoretical framework that you developed, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that because it's a pretty meaningful discourse. Yeah, the, you know, I come from a communication perspective, so we look at particular types of social justice problems like poverty, homelessness, as a type of discourse. That's the way we talk about that. That's not to say that there aren't important material conditions. There are. People are starving. People don't have homes. People are being executed in our country um, for uh, death capital offenses. Um, and we think that if we could change the nature of those conversations, if we could use all of our communication resources, we are incredibly good as communication scholars at doing things like giving public speeches, facilitating group interaction, um, making videos, public service announcements, other media products. And if we can bring all of that to bear, we might just be able to have something to offer to marginalized communities, to social justice organizations that are trying to work on these incredible problems. So we see it as using the essence of our discipline, communication. I mean, what is activism? It really is bringing people together 
collaborating together, communicating together to try to accomplish some important goals. And so I think that's why it's a unique form of pedagogy. Whether there is a sociological activism pedagogy, I don't know, or an anthropological activism pedagogy, maybe there is, but I know what a communication activism pedagogy is. So you're right, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to articulate a theoretical perspective on how do we actually teach students. I was fascinated that there's a thread through the book that kind of plays the corporate versus um, the other, you know, stuff. Yeah, I would, I would really look at maybe three areas. One would be corporate. And so there are folks who intervene, let's say, to help organizations make more money for profit. There are a number of organizational communication scholars who they work with these organizations and they try to promote. And, and by the way, I'm not saying that preparing people for the business world is bad. No, it's incredibly good to do that. We think that communication activism pedagogy actually does that really well by giving people actual experiences working with the largest growing sector of jobs, which is the nonprofit world. I think between 2011, or 2001, 2011, nonprofit jobs went up about 25%. That's far more than in the business world. So there's the corporate side of things. Then there is the civic projects, and those are very important as well. And so you have a lot of um, educators who are trying to help students to become involved in their civic communities. Wonderful type of work, no doubt about that. And then the alternative would be the communication activism pedagogy, the interventions into social justice problems. Well, one of the things I was interested in was listening to the voices of the silenced or the not heard um, because of their needs. And, you know, I, I think of Ferguson, Missouri, and there's all kinds of needs that in, in the book, there's all kinds of populations that are discussed in, in that sense. Oh, oh, yeah, there's so many marginalized communities that are out there that could use a lot, a lot of help and a lot of aid. And so you're talking about people who are underemployed, you're talking about racial incidents and racial communities that have been oppressed. There are just so many that are out there. One of the things that fascinated me was uh, the question of what motivated you and David Palmer to use this version of pedagogy to address the significant social issues of our society. Um, we come from a communication background, so that's our sort of home. And we basically use the things that we know and that we teach. And so we felt that it was most important to stay true to what our groundings is. We're not educators in the sense that we study education. We don't come out of that. We don't come out of sociology. We don't come out of psychology. We come out of communication. So we stick pretty closely to that perspective. But it's not really just passing the message along. It's not rip and read. It's really evaluating and and considering the message and its effect on the people who are hearing it. Yeah, yeah, and it's even larger than that. I mean, if you think about communication, most people see it as a form of getting information from one place to another. But there's another way of looking at it, and that is that we live in communication. That's where we live. That's how we conceive of things. I mean, what is a relationship? It is a type of conversation. And so we are fundamentally interested in how could we have different conversations. And if we had different conversations, maybe we'd have different policies. One question that came to my mind is how did you select the people who participated in the dialogue in this book? Uh, we put out an open call for people to submit proposals. Um, we got a lot of them, we got about 100. And from there we called down to the 15 or 16 that we decided to use for this project. Well, I thought there was a lot of brilliant people who wrote chapters for this book. Oh, yeah, I mean, we're really impressed with them. Interestingly, uh, most of them, of course, are teachers. 
So they weren't used to writing about their pedagogy. And that was one of the most important things for us, was to try to um, get them to articulate about their pedagogy. The, the people themselves are wonderful people. They are involved in so many wonderful um, social justice efforts. You know, you've got people like Kim Cooney, for example, at Greensboro, who's trying to do something about the achievement gap between blacks and whites. And what she does is she runs a speaking center there. And she invites community members in, and she basically educates them about how to give public speeches down at City Hall about changing the policies so that the educational system will pay more attention to African Americans, to Latinos and Latinas, um, to people who traditionally have been marginalized. And she's able to show that, in fact, when you change those policies, you start to g lessen the achievement gap. So you have folks like that. You have Chris Carey, who's doing work um, up in the Pacific Northwest, working on stopping timber uh, sales, cutting down trees in our national forests, the old growth forests that are really disappearing quickly. And what he does is teach students um, how to go out and do what he calls ground truthing, which is to take people on hikes, the community members, show them the devastation, help them to write letters to the US Forest Service protesting against these kinds of timber sales. And they've been able to stop a number of them through those kinds of activities. Those are just two examples of the 10 or 15 that we give in the book. Well, I thought it was fascinating. In each chapter, there's always a theoretical placement of what the issue is. And then there's always a, an attempt to understand the population that they're dealing with, you know, the group, uh, and then form, you know, uh, a plan of action, and then take it a step further by having them actually do it and yeah. share it to the community. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there's, what, nothing as practical as a good theory. Certainly, Lewin said that, and um, we find that to be true, that if you can start with a theoretical understanding and then use that to kind of shape the kinds of problems we're looking at, the kinds of solutions to it, and the kinds of messages that we want to give about that, then these folks can turn around, put that into practice, and here's the key, study that practice. So lots of educators are out there doing this. They're in their communities, their students are involved with important groups on important problems, but what they're not doing it is actually studying that as a research project. And we said, why don't we do that? Why don't we have folks actually study their teaching practices? And by doing that, we turn pedagogy into research as well. And so it's, it is a full-blown attempt to kind of piece together theory, method, and then actually application. There are tons of books and tons of articles, and I've written some of them too, that are heavily conceptual. They sort of say, here's what you should do. You know, and of course, everything sounds great when you say, here's what you should do. What they don't do is they say, here's an example of that. Let's show you an actual empirical example. And so I'm committed, as you know, from the communication activism research perspective, where I did two books, and you were kind enough to interview me about those. Um, those are empirical examples. That's what these are as well. They're empirical examples of teachers who have really brought their resources to bear and taught their students how to intervene to solve social justice problems. A key word that goes through the whole book is the notion of intervention. Right. And maybe you can explain what that is, because it's m more than just tapping yeah, I mean, intervention is a loaded word, and we realize that. Some people associate that kind of with uh, imperialism and a number of other uh, sort of negative connotations. Our view of intervening is the notion of making a difference, of trying to change the current situation so that it does get better in some sense. Now, let me just say that's an awfully large goal. We're not always able to do that. And in fact, in many cases, the folks who work on these projects are not able to accomplish what they'd like. But what they are doing is actively attempting to bring about 
some kind of change. Now, again, how do they do that? They do that by protesting. They do that by writing letters to the U.S. Forest Service and other agencies, testifying in Congress, working with community members to teach them how to give public speeches down at City Hall to get certain policies um, accepted, um, filming um, migrant workers who, in the, in, who are laboring in the fields and then showing that on public television, raising funds to try to change the hate speech that's going on when we talk about migrant workers. Those are what we mean by interventions. And so our view of an intervention is really some action that a person takes to try to change what we would call the nature of the conversation, how people are talking about it. What are the words that they're using to describe people, situations, problems? That's a communication approach. One of the things I liked is how many of them had evaluated how it went mm -hmm. and what could have been done better and what didn't go so well and what did go so well. It's tough, you know, I mean, you, you talk about something like, let's say you take students and you say, well, let's go try to get somebody off death row and change that condition. I mean, the odds are you're not going to be able to do that. And so on one level, you have to set realistic goals for students and expectations. It can't be that if we don't save the person, then we fail. Our view is that we try to do something. And hopefully we can document the effects. But the most important effects, of course, are in pedagogy on the students. And what they learn is a long-term commitment that social justice is not a matter of achieving something tomorrow. It may well be that it's going to take years, decades, centuries to make some of these changes. But what they do become is committed to doing that kind of work. And so, yeah, the folks are trying to evaluate what they did in their projects. They're not always successful at that. It's hard to document some of the kinds of effects we're talking about, especially on students, no doubt about that. But we're trying. They have students, for example, keep journals of their experience. Um, and then they analyze the nature of those journals from the start to the end of the project to see exactly how they have matured and how they've changed in their views of social problems, interventions, social justice. Well, and I think it's, this process stimulates students to become critically involved with what they're doing and reflected. And so when they come to the end and then they reflect on it, I think that probably has a very valuable impact on them oh, to man. see that when you start off with something big, you may not get there, but you learn something in the doing of it. Yeah, so many of the students indicated that they, you know, wanted to go into, say, social services or they wanted to go into some kind of social justice um, profession after being exposed. And so a lot of it is about the attitudes, the beliefs, the attitudes, the values, and then, of course, the behaviors, what they're exactly going to do. It's not just pushing papers. It's becoming involved with people, which is yeah. a whole different dimension. Yeah, there are important problems that people are experiencing. The real question is, what are we doing about that as educators? You know, that's the real issue. And there are wonderful educators, don't get me wrong, who, you know, help students to understand the world, who help them to become critical about the practices that dominant structures are using. What they don't get experience in is trying to actually make a difference. You know, we often hope that the difference that we make as educators will come from our teaching. In other words, we'll teach people and then eventually they'll change the world. Well, communication active and pedagogy says, why don't we make the change through our teaching? Let's actually try it that way and see how we can affect the world. The four sections of this book are really extensive and they include understanding CAP 
infusing activism um, in communication courses. I noticed that a number of the chapters have syllabi, yeah. which I found really, fa as a faculty member myself, I love reading syllabi. <laughs> and I found really interesting how the different people were trying to incorporate communication, activism, pedagogy into their classes. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to do it. I mean, one way is to teach actual courses on communication activism. And so we went out and found folks who were doing that. Bill, Billy Murray, for example, Natalie Fixmer or Rays are teaching a course called communication activism. And we thought, well, why don't we actually put the syllabi in there? Because, you know, it's one thing to talk about like here's what I do in my teaching. It's another to say, okay, on this day of this week we do this, and then we do that, and here's the way we evaluate students. And so um, it was great to get the syllabi or about environmental activism. How would you teach that kind of course? By the way, David Palmer has put together a website called Communication Activism Teaching that also features a lot of other syllabi, a lot of assignments that people can use, readings in the courses. So it really is a kind of full-blown sort of attempt to make this pedagogy very well-rounded, not just theoretical, not just empirical, but also very practical as well. One of the key concepts throughout the book is the notion of service learning. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can discuss that some. Yeah, Lori Britt wrote a brilliant chapter. It was part of her, uh, came out of her dissertation, which she did at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I am. And she distinguishes three types of service learning. One she calls skill set and reflexivity. And very important, you give people the experience of acquiring skills. And you, you see that a lot in the business side of that, where people will do uh, service learning internships with companies and learn the skills. The second form she calls civic service learning. So there are a number of uh, courses in which you might uh, teach students how to get people to vote. Sort of doesn't matter what they vote for, but getting more people to vote would be the goal. And then the third she identifies is social justice activism service learning. She says that the first two could well be seen as charity approaches, you know, in the sense that we're not really dealing with social justice, we're essentially giving handouts and helping those who are poor. And by doing that, we kind of maintain the system. We never challenge the dominant structures. We merely try to change the immediate conditions that people experience. In contrast to that is social justice service learning that really involves situating students with social justice organizations, with those populations that are most marginalized, most under-resourced, have been shut out of the American dream, and working together, they try to make some kind of change. And that's the kind that we're interested in. We're not interested in the charity approach. There's a humorous example of that that Colby et al., some authors said, where they went and they interviewed um, a father about his daughter's experience working in a soup kitchen. And the father said, it was a really wonderful experience for my daughter. I hope that when my youngest daughter goes to college, the soup kitchen is still there. You know, that's, I mean, it's a funny kind of comment, but it also speaks to the issue of what charity does. And too much of service learning takes that kind of approach, that here are these elite students who are going to help these poor individuals, and we're going to give to them out of our largesse, you know, because we're such great people and we're going to help them. Social justice takes a very different perspective. It says essentially that you know, none of us are free if some of us are oppressed. And that we don't do this to help them. We do this because we recognize that, look, something is wrong in a culture of abundance if some of us are well off and some of us are not. It's out of identification with people. And that's the real teaching, I think, of social justice activism service learning, that when students are really immersed in it, 
they learn that they are all just human beings. That's all we are. We all struggle. We all identify with one another. And we do this because of our commitments to humanity, not because we have something and somebody else doesn't. One of the questions I've got is, what's been the reaction to this version of pedagogy involving direct student intervention? Well, it's still pretty new, so I think the reaction's evolving. Um, one, I would say that the um, critical pedagogy people have been really kind about that. Uh, they have really seen the benefits of this pedagogy. Um, Peter McLaren, who is a very well-known critical pedagogue, um, a scholar who's written many, many books, um, we wrote to him blind and said, you know, we're working on this kind of pedagogy and we'd really like you to take a look at it. And if you feel comfortable, would you just write a statement for us, just a blurb that we might be able to use. He took a look, he wrote back and he said, could I write the foreword? I'm really impressed with this work. It really does push critical pedagogy. We were blown away by that. We were like, Shh, of course, you can write the for Ken Saltman, another um, education specialist in critical pedagogy um, wrote for us. Um, a number of folks have really responded well. Um, there's a journal called Radical Teacher. They picked up on it. Um, they want to publish a piece about it. So I think that we're getting good response to it. Um, of course, there are folks from the sort of corporate side who might question that. You know, I'm sure if you asked Stanley Fish, for example, what he thought about this pedagogy, um, he'd probably not resonate with it. I think he would say that this is not the kind of political teaching that ought to be going on at our universities. Of course, that ignores all of the political teachings that are going on, for example, in the business school, right? About it's still political. Of course, teaching people derivatives and market economy, and, which is fine, but they sort of recognize that as not being political when in fact it is political. So it's not a matter of should education be political? That, that question is moot. The only question is should we expose students to the wide range of political ideologies and practices? Is that not what a university is for? So I would maintain that the university is for teaching people how to intervene into discourses. And I think there's a healthy body of educators and scholars who recognize that, who resonate with that, who want to do it. I think there are a lot, a lot of folks. And that's one of the important reasons we wrote this book, was to say, look, you too can do this. I mean, any educator, especially in communication, can do CAP. It doesn't matter whether you're teaching interpersonal communication, small group, media, doesn't matter. You can bring your resources to bear and teach students how to intervene into those particular relationships. Well, thank you for being on RIPT to talk about teaching communication activism, communication education, and social justice. <laughs> Couldn't quite see it then. But thank you for appearing on RIPT. Oh, thank you, Jim. I really appreciate it. Thank you.